Thank you for worshiping with Crossroads Nazarene Church. For more information about Crossroads, please visit our website at cvcrossroads.com. There you can find out more about our church, online giving, and small groups. You can also find us on Facebook at CV Crossroads. Well, here we are, five days before Christmas, and looking forward to this week, going to be a special week in the days leading up to Christmas, and Christmas Eve, and then actual Christmas Day. And I hope you have your plans together uh, with family, friends, loved ones, whether it's contacting them in person, or whether it's more by Zoom or by phone, that, that we're making those opportunities. What a great, what a great chance it is to be together during this Christmas season. So imagine you've gone down to, to Redbox at your local Walmart and you check out your favorite holiday movie. You, you rent it and bring it home. Quickly, you get the popcorn ready. There's a tall glass of your favorite soda waiting. You grab the remote, sit down at the recliner and lean back for, to spend a couple of enjoyable hours with yourself or your family. You hit play. You expect the movie to start, but, but what actually happens? What happens is the film industry has placed a bunch of advertisements, which are called trailers, at the start. And so you have to either fast forward or sit through a whole bunch of previews. I'd like to begin my message today with a preview. A preview of perhaps what may be a coming attraction. This is titled, Twas the Day After Christmas. Twas the day after Christmas, and all through the house, every creature was hurting, even the mouse. The toys were all broken, their batteries dead. Santa passed out with some ice on his head. Wrapping and ribbons just covered the floor, while upstairs the family continued to snore. And I in my t-shirt, new Reeboks and jeans, I went into the kitchen and started to clean. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the sink to see what was the matter. Away to the window, window I flew like a flash, tore open the curtains, and threw up the sash. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a little white truck with an oversized mirror. The driver was smiling so lively and grand, the patch on his jacket said, U.S. Postman. With a handful of bills, he grinned like a fox. Then quickly he stuffed them into our mailbox. Bill after bill after bill, they still came, whistling and shouting, he called them by name. Now Dillard's, now Broadway's, now Pennies and Sears. Here's Robinson's, Levitt's, and Target's, and Mervyn's. To the tip of your limit, every store, every mall, now charge away, charge away, charge away all. He whooped and he whistled as he finished his work. He filled up the box and then turned with a jerk. He sprang to his truck and he drove down the road, driving much faster with just half a load. Then I heard him exclaim with great holiday cheer, Enjoy what you got. You will be paying all year. Well, in the weeks leading up to Christmas, we're focusing our attention upon some of the holiday traditions we celebrate. We are wanting to season the season by bringing out the true flavor of Christ in all of our Christmas activities. We want our season to be seasoned with greetings, with the love of Jesus. We're determined that our, seasoned, our seasons be ones of giving with an awareness of the gift that God gave us when He sent Jesus Christ. We are choosing to season our gatherings with Christ's presence in order to avoid some of the holiday stresses and conflict we sometimes experience when our family comes together. And so we, here we are. We are close to COVID Christmas Day of 2020, just five days away when we are going to participate in the tradition most associated with Christmas, and that is the custom of receiving gifts. Many of us are in that final round of shopping. We have given time and, and money to businesses and persons. The gifts are wrapped. They are ready to be received. This morning, 
Let's take a few moments to be reminded of some ways that we can season our getting. It's very sad but true that too many gifts that are given sincerely and sacrificially are received critically or apathetically. There is a reason why the second largest shopping day of the year is December 26th, the day after Christmas. It's not just because of the markdown clearance prices after Christmas Day is passed. The longest line in most stores the day after Christmas is the return line. Some of the line are returning things because they're the wrong size or because there's some defect in the product. But most are there for one simple reason. They don't like the gift that they were given. This is certainly not to imply we should wear a blouse that is five sizes too big or that returning or replacing an unneeded gift is the wrong thing to do. But what I want us to discover today is some ways we can season our getting, how we can receive joyfully from others. As I was preparing the message this week, I put together a PowerPoint that I thought might be a little bit helpful to us, of course, tongue in cheek here. But uh, let's take a look at to the top 10 things to say about gifts that you don't really like. Number 10 is, well, 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 now there's a gift. Number nine, this is perfect for wearing in the basement. How about number eight? Hey, as long as I don't have to feed it or clean up after it or put batteries in it, I'm happy. Number seven, gosh, I hope this never catches fire. Number six, you know, I've always wanted one of these. Jog my memory. What's it called again? Or number five, you know what? I'm going to find a very special place to put this. Four, it would be a shame if the garbage man ever accidentally took this from me. Or five, to say, you shouldn't have. I mean, really, you shouldn't have. Number two, you say that was the last one? Am I so glad you snapped that sucker up? Or perhaps number one, to respond, if the dog buries this, I'm going to be furious. In the first chapter of Luke's Gospel, we are given a wonderful example of how to receive a gift. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, follow along with me as I read. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary is greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. So in this account of the birth of Christ, the angel Gabriel startles a young teenager by the name of Mary with a very unexpected visit. She is engaged to be married to a carpenter from Nazareth and has marriage plans in her mind constantly. Even though the angel assures Mary that she has nothing to be afraid of, 
he continues to startle her by describing what God has in mind for her life. Gabriel explains how she will have a child even though she has never been with a man. Her head is spinning, her heart is racing, but her soul is at rest, as we can see in her reply to Gabriel at the end of his message. She responded and said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. It was an incredible gift that Mary was given. Yet it was also an unexpected one, and maybe in some ways it was even an unwanted one, or at least a gift that Mary felt did not fit her very well, much too big for such a young woman, of course. But for Mary, we are given an example of how to season our getting, how to receive a gift. First, notice that we are to receive graciously. To receive graciously. For hundreds of years before Mary came to this earth, every Jewish girl had been told of the Messiah's coming and that one fortunate woman would be the mother of the, the Redeemer. Every Jewish girl hoped she would be that chosen one. Very likely that applied to Mary too. And yet notice her humility in receiving this announcement. She didn't receive the news by saying, well, it's about time. I was wondering when I was going to finally make God's highly favored list. Look out, girls, good old Mare is stepping into the spotlight. No, she received this news graciously. She was startled. She was frightened by the appearance of Gabriel, as any of us would be. But she received the gift graciously. Perhaps one of the most annoying gifts for teenagers, especially teenage boys, is probably to receive underwear. I'm talking about plain white underwear for Christmas. Well, during my years of junior high and senior high, senior high my three brothers and I each year received the same identical gift from our grandparents on my mom's side, from her parents. Grandma, being of very staunch Norwegian descent, would go down to the store and buy a four-pack of plain white underwear. She would open the sack and individually wrap each of the skivvies in Christmas paper. She wasn't poor. She wasn't being cheap or thoughtless. She genuinely considered it to be a great gift. Now, all four of us boys in our family were born within a six-year time frame, and so obviously we were not all the same size. The oldest boy was 12 when the youngest was six, but Grandma didn't think about that. She apparently didn't know that white underwear is not a one-size-fits-all type of a thing. So she would just buy underwear in a particular size that was up there and in, on, on the shelf, and so in my case, it was usually about six sizes too small. So three of us could not even wear them, and we couldn't return them because she had torn open the package. I have to admit that we did not receive those undies with much appreciation. Perhaps you can relate to this story. There are some gifts under the tree with your name on them. Some of them will likely be the wrong size, Maybe the wrong color, the wrong item, in fact, the wrong everything. Some of you may even get some tidy whities this year, but hopefully it'll be in the right size. But the package won't contain what you hoped for. And you will have an opportunity. You're going to receive it grumpily, or you can receive it greedily or graciously. One important way to season our getting is to choose ahead of time, before the receiving begins, to receive graciously. Second, receive willingly. Mary received willingly. And there were many reasons, when we think about it, that she may not have been all that willing to receive. One of those was her own personal timing in her life. Remember, she was engaged to be married. She was developing her relationship with, with Joseph. 
This was not a good time to announce a pregnancy. There were also personal goals. The plan that she had for her life up to this point had to be willingly set aside in order to receive God's plan. We are very sure that Mary's plans did not include an unexpected move to Egypt once the baby was born. Her dreams of having children did not include the plan of being looked down upon in the community because of a pregnancy that no one except Joseph would be able to believe. There were also personal preferences. She wanted stability. She wanted a husband. She wanted a, a home. She wanted children. These were her preferences. Have you ever noticed that some of the greatest gifts we receive are those that we may not appreciate that much when we first receive them? But then, as time goes on, we appreciate that gift more and more. So there must be a willingness to accept the gift, to choose it instead of trading it in for something else. Third, receive gratefully. Receive gratefully. We see that Mary received with gratitude. We observe that her plans were indeed set aside, and yet she was still grateful. She was thankful for the opportunity to be a part of God's plan for herself, but also for humanity. It was an unexpected gift, but she received it gratefully. A few years ago, I read an article about gifts that the writer described as grace gifts. These are gifts that are given out of love and appreciation. Grace gifts are those that cannot be repaid. They cannot be reimbursed because they were given simply with an attitude of grace toward us personally. Grace gifts. This is a kind of a gift that my son Andrew and I received back in the year 2006. We were in the middle of nowhere in a dirt road about 20 miles north of Battle Mountain, Nevada, and we got a flat tire. Well, upon making plans to change the tire, we discovered we did not have the tools we needed to change that tire. And we were trying to decide what in the world we were going to do when a young man in an old pickup truck happened by. He stopped, as people always will do when someone is broken down in the boonies, but this guy spent the next three hours driving into town, picking up the needed tools, and then he insisted on changing the tire for us. I think the reason he did that was because he figured if we weren't smart enough to bring the tools to change a tire, we probably didn't know how to change the tire either. But in any case, we offered to pay him for his kindness, and he refused. It was a pure grace gift. In your circumstances, maybe that grace gift is that anonymous cash gift that you received during a difficult time. Maybe it's what you received from that person that you did not know or who did not know that you were going through a difficult time and were discouraged and provided you a heartfelt compliment that encouraged you very much. Grace gifts those are those quick notes or emails that you sometimes receive from those you haven't heard from from a long time, thanking you just for being their friend. In reality, you and I have all received many, many grace gifts in our lives. And there's only one way to receive a grace gift, and that is with gratitude. Can you imagine the new meaning and joy that is experienced in our tradition of receiving gifts when we choose, in response to every gift we receive, to be genuinely grateful, to be thankful for what was given. Even if it doesn't fit, even if it's the wrong color, even if it's something we really don't need, even if it's something that we will need to exchange after Christmas. Receiving with gratitude is going to give new meaning to our holiday tradition of receiving. And we will season the season. We can season the season with the flavor of Jesus Christ by receiving graciously, willingly, and gratefully. 
a pastor in a Christmas message was attempting to illustrate the gift of God's salvation and he announced to the congregation, whoever wants this beautiful poinsettia up here in front may have it. All you have to do is take it. The pastor paused and the people kind of stared as he waited. They looked at the poinsettia. It was, it was a gorgeous flower, unusually large, wrapped, wrapped in red cellophane in a gold with a gold satin ribbon. Finally, one woman raised her hand and ventured and said, well, okay, I'll, I'll take it. Great, the pastor said, come on up and get it. But then the woman turned to her son who was sitting to her, next to her and said, hey, run up there and get it for me. No, the pastor countered, whoever wants this gift must pick it up personally. You can't send a substitute for you. Well, she didn't want to get up and go up to the front. So she said, oh, just forget it. Somebody else can have it. So the pastor waited again. The people were silent for a bit, and then there were some skeptical responses you could hear murmured throughout the crowd, like, okay, what's the catch here? Some were saying, I think the pastor's doing a, a prank here. I think he glued it to the floor. Some said, well, can, can I just take it after the service if I tell you I want it now? And the past pastor, because of, of that response, was kind of tempted to give in. He kind of marveled at the power of passive resistance to a free gift. And he reminded him, this is free, but you have to come and get it, and you have to come and get it right now. Well, then a woman who had never attended the church before that day stood up in the back. She hurried to the front as if she were afraid that she would change her mind on the way. And she said, I will take it. And she picked up the poinsettia. As she returned to her seat with the gift, the minister began to read Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are told to believe and to receive and it is free, it's a gift. After the service, when, when most of the people had, had gone home, the visiting woman, poinsettia in hand, came up to the pastor. Here, she said, as she held out her other hand, this flower is too pretty for me to take for free. I couldn't do it with a clear conscience. And the pastor looked down at the crumpled paper that she had extended to him. It was a $20 Bill. We understand that Christmas is truly about the greatest gift God ever offered. And God, because of his love for us, even though we have sinned against him and disobeyed his plan, he's offered us a free gift. It's forgiveness from sin. It's a forgiveness that provides us eternal life. He gives us this gift in Jesus Christ. But again, it's a gift, which means we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. It's a gift that we all need, a gift that we must receive in order to know God as a father. You can receive this gift. We receive it graciously. We receive it willingly. And we receive it gratefully. Let's pray. Father, this is going to be a wonderful week. A week where, in a few days, we are going to experience the joy of getting, receiving gifts. As we receive, help us to keep within our hearts and minds the awareness that the greatest gift ever given to us is one that we could never earn we don't deserve, and yet it is a, it is a gift that, that we all need. One size truly does fit each of us. And that is the gift that you have given to us in Jesus Christ. There may be those today who are listening to this message who have never received that gift. Maybe they're aware of the gift that is available, aware of, of what that means but Lord, have never actually went and received it personally. So today, Father, 
we would ask that perhaps this would be the day that that gift would be received. We receive it by simply saying, Father, I acknowledge the fact that, that I have done things that I know that I should not have done. I come to you today and acknowledge that, and I ask that you would forgive me for everything I've ever done that was wrong. I open the door of my life. I invite you in. I invite you to lead me and guide me and teach me what it means to live as your child. Thank you, Father, that that gift is offered to every one of us. And so, as we prepare for Christmas, as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, through our various traditions and the things that we do, we pray there would be a constant remembering of the fact of what you've got done for us on Christmas Day. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. So, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. If you're able to be with family, may these be blessed times, times that where good memories are created. If this is a year, because of our circumstance, you're going to be more isolated and not able to be with family, I pray that this will yet be a blessed year, a year of, of experiencing God's presence that's with us at all times, wherever we are, whatever the circumstances we're facing. So God bless you, and Merry Christmas. Thank you.